Welcome to the 12th District. I'm Kerry Condotta. This is the NCW Life Channel. Well, we are following the legislature. It's off to a hot start down in Olympia. The bills are flying over 1,000 bills filed. To put that in perspective, Idaho has filed 19 in the same time frame. Things are just about, I would say, close to insane in Olympia right now. Some of the bills that are floating are unbelievable. We're going to talk about all that with Mike Steele. He'll be with us most of the show today. To, to talk about his first week or two in Olympia and how crazy it's gotten and how far off track they really are relative to what's going on in Washington State. There just doesn't seem to be any connection between reality and Olympia. Of course, uh, the big news this week politically was uh, President, ex-President Trump or former President Trump winning the Iowa caucuses by a large margin. Uh, by the time this show airs, you will have the New Hampshire results and I suspect they'll be somewhat the same. And we'll go on from there. We'll be talking more about the presidential side of things in the coming weeks on the, this show and of course following the legislature during the entire time. So well, let's get right to it. Let's get to Mike Steele and Olympia and see what he has to say about what is shaping up to be a really, really partisan session, the most partisan probably ever. We'll be right back with the 12 minutes. Welcome back to the 12th District. Well, as promised, Representative Mike Steele, from his new office in Olympia, deputy leader now gets the nice office on the third floor. I can remember hanging out there a lot. So uh, welcome aboard, Mike. Nice to have you. Thanks for having me, Carrie. Good to see you. Yeah, well, a, a crazy first week and a half. They didn't take any time getting off to a hot start down there. And of course, a lot of controversial bills and a lot going on. Tell us a little bit about your first week or so down in Olympia. Yeah, I mean, it's been fascinating already. You know, this is the first time I can remember in the nearly decade I've been in the legislature that we started the session with passing of bills off the floor. I mean, we we went to work immediately. And I guess we have to because they've introduced nearly a thousand bills uh, on top of the 3,000 bills that are still alive from last year. Uh, and so, you know, I guess if we're going to they're going to spend that kind of volume in 60 days, I guess we better get get moving. Uh, Mike, it's just been fascinating. Mike, I got to ask you something real quick on that thousand bills introduced. Do you know how many were introduced in Idaho in the same time period? Probably eight. <laughs> Nin Nineteen. They outdid themselves. They went to 19. So this is how crazy it is over there. All right. So from there, where does it go? <laughs> so, you know, we, I mean, we've been uh, very, very busy in committees already. Um, you know, we're hearing a, an amazing amount of bills and, and haven't started to exec them yet, but we're hearing some just in, uh, some sort of outlandish stuff too. I mean, it's just a no holds bar. It seems like in a, in a year that I had hoped would be just a quick sixty day session, deal with the things we needed to and, uh, and and move on. I mean, the other thing that we've got coming our way and we've already experienced uh, with one initiative is um, it's sort of it's history making right now. Uh, you know, the legislature in, in years past has maybe dealt with one initiative to the legislature, maybe two, and I think our record was three. Uh, we are looking down uh, potentially at six initiatives. Uh, here coming to us. And we've had, a, you know, in my new role, um, the minority leader and I, we've had uh, several conversations now with the Speaker of the House and the majority leader trying to figure out how they're going to handle these initiatives because, of course, as you know, Carrie, our Constitution is pretty explicit in how we should deal with them. They should be the priority of the legislature above and beyond any other bills with the exception of budget bills. And so um, what that means to us is that when these things arrive, we need to deal with them right away. And we need to get them to committees and get a hearing. And and that's what, what the Constitution says. Um, so we, uh, I spent this last weekend negotiating with the majority party to try and get our first initiative, police pursuit, uh, which was uh, certified and sent to the legislature. We had to make a motion to suspend the rules uh, so that we could move that bill, that initiative rather, into a committee for a public hearing. Uh, and that was flatly voted down uh, on party lines. Uh, all Republicans voted for it, all uh, Democrats voted against it. So uh, it is not going to move and we'll go to the people in November for a vote. Is that the final vote? It, can it be uh, brought back at some point during the session, or does it, do you feel that this is just their, they're just going to avoid all these and send them out? That's what it looks like at this point. That's cer certainly what it looks like. You know, unfortunately for for us, you know, there was a lot. I mean, there were uh, to be frank. I mean, there was a long series of debates over the weekend on as to whether or not they would even allow us 
uh, a motion, but we finally said to them, hey, we are allowed to suspend the, the rules at any time. Uh, you, can't, you can't block that motion. And uh, they finally had to coalesce around that and agreed. And so we were able to make the motion, but it, it, as I said, it didn't go anywhere. And I agree, I think this is gonna be the, the uh, sort of mode of operation, if you will. Well, the second is uh, second one is carbon taxes on the way to you. The third one should be about the time this airs. We should have three or four. Uh, if if they do the same thing on each one, I guess that uh, tells you where they're at. But it is a recorded vote, as I understand it. Uh, so that is something that uh, is a good thing in the long run to say, look, you know, you punted on this thing, so away it goes. But uh, they're certainly going to get to the ballot one way or the other. It sounds like. Yeah, and I, you know, I said all along that people should have a voice in this. I mean, we are, uh, you know, another sort of an fascinating development yesterday uh, is that the Supreme Court decided not to take up the capital gains tax. Uh, you know, we are literally the, you know, 49, 49 other states would consider anything qualified as a capital gains income excise tax as part of an income tax, uh, which we have said in this state is not what we want. Uh, we find it to be unconstitutional. So it's fascinating that nine justices in the whole of the country can't figure out with even the word in the definition of the name income, that it's an income tax. So fascinating that they chose not to take that up. Yeah, by not taking that up, uh, it makes the initiative the only ticket uh, on, the, on the docket. And of course, that's backed up with another initiative that says no income tax and reestablishes the terminology. So this is going to get very, very interesting. It's obvious that they're being very defiant. That I don't know if you know this, the uh, head of the Democrat Party, the chairman of the state party, has said they have no intention of working with Republicans. This is a, just about a quote. I uh, have no intention of working with Republicans in this session or any further session and expect to get a supermajority by 2026, which will make the point moot. Now, that's a pretty uh, a st a strong comment. It's a bold statement, and it's unfortunate because, you know, as you know, Carrie, down here, we actually do have uh, working relationships with folks, and we're trying uh, to negotiate good public policy. And, and, I, and I tell people this all the time. You know, politics is not about who's right or who is wrong, or at least it shouldn't be. It's about the art of negotiation and arriving to a place where we all can agree to move forward for the betterment of the whole of our state or the whole of our nation. And we've lost that, you know, and when you have party chairs like that, saying things like that publicly, that's very disappointing. And, and, and in fact, we've seen 30 years of a single party rule in Washington, uh, and it's not, it's not proven to be good for Washingtonians. I mean, we've got higher prices at the pump, we've got record inflation, people can't find work, housing prices through the roof. I mean, homelessness like we've never seen, public safety in the toilet, folks telling me all the time, regardless of party, that they feel less safe in their own homes and their own communities. These are things we need to fix. And if Democrats are not willing to fix them, then they should be willing to work with Republicans to address the issues. Well, I would, you would certainly think so. There's not a single metric, not one that we can find that's in a positive direction in the state of Washington under this leadership. So some change in direction is warranted. Now, the, the one you might have not mentioned there, which is fascinating, is Danny Wesney, who's a writer for the Seattle Times, and by, I would say, by all means, one of the most liberal writers in the state, has penned an editorial saying that the educate, public education system in this state is in desperate trouble. It's in deep trouble. And, there doesn't, and he <laughs> said as much as so that there doesn't seem to be any leadership to change it. Now, you've been uh, at times uh, on the education board and interested in K through 12. What, is there anything happening to fix that mess? You know, that's a great question, Carrie. And I have served on the Education Committee my entire time in the legislature, at one point serving as the ranking member. I, I remain on that committee and, you know, it is it is frustrating. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been pushing for for, for you know, years in this legislature is to fully fund special education. And when we have record revenues in this state and we cannot help the, the, the students who are struggling the most, we don't make them a priority, we don't fully fund the special education for our school districts, uh, who are, you know, having to take their own money and backfill what the state should be handling with respect to, to special uh, special ed, and and we just can't get there. It's frustrating. I mean, those are kids that really need the help, families that really want the help, and we're not we're not delivering for them. That's just one area. But you know, the the fact is, we've we've dedicated thirty three billion dollars out of a seventy billion dollar budget to K twelve education, and we know that money is not the answer because our scores. Uh, you know, continue to plummet. You know, we are some of the worst scores in the nation as it relates to K-12 education. So I just encourage folks to, to look at the data uh, and, and encourage your legislators 
to, to do something different. I mean, we're working really hard as a caucus to try and move that needle, but it has to be based on student outcomes and it can't just be based on compensation and extra money uh, going to the system because we've overloaded that system with money and we're not seeing results. Well, that's a fact. Uh, the results just get, keep getting worse. Uh, Mike, we're going to take a quick break here and uh, come back. And we, I want to get on some specific bills. There is some really um, crazy legislation down there. I want to touch base with you on a few of those. We'll be right back with Mike Steele from Olympia. This is the 12th District. <laughs> Welcome back with Representative Mike Steele from his new office in the third floor of the Ledge Building. If you are happen to stop down there, definitely uh, look Mike or any of your reps up. It's always fun to go to the Capitol. If you haven't done it, it's, it's an experience. Now, let's get into a couple of the specific bills. Representative Steele, I got to tell you, the one that shakes me up is this property tax idea of raising the limit, uh, growth limit from 1% to 3%. Now, I know there's cities and counties that feel they need that flexibility, but overall, the housing situation, the cost of housing, the cost of property taxes in general after McCleary is substantial and this is not going to make things better. Do you think they will actually move that bill forward and increase property taxes dramatically in Washington State? Well, I sure hope not. We're going to do everything we can to make sure that bill does not move forward. You know, and my good friend, Senator Mullet, a Democrat, uh, it says he says over and over again, I wish my party would learn that you cannot tax housing to solve the housing crisis. <laughs> uh, and and uh, I think that's exactly right. You know, Republicans would agree with that. You cannot you cannot continue to regulate that industry and overtax that industry with some sort of hope that you're going to be providing uh, additional housing for folks who need it. It's just the wrong way to do things. And in our district, Carrie, you know, the 12th legislative district, we we have a beautiful place to live. And of course, that comes with higher property taxes than most uh, in Washington state. And we're already feeling the pinch and we could not afford to see a major a major swing of 3% increases uh, in a single year. It would just be devastating for folks who have lived generationally in homes. In, in my case, you know, where I live in Chelan, there's a lot of folks who have had the same piece of property for generations. And now they're facing the very real proposition of being taxed out of their home uh, and that they've, they've had family ties for over generations. And that's, that's just su super sad. And the legislature should be very aware, acutely aware of what we're doing when we're when we're talking about who we're taxing and why we're taxing you know and, and again washington state i'll say this over and over again does not have a revenues problem we have a spending problem you know we in my time in the legislature the general fund budget has doubled has doubled from 30 billion dollars 35 billion dollars to 70 billion dollars in less than 10 years there's not a single household in washington state that has seen that same kind of growth and so we should be very, very aware that this is not a revenues problem. This is a spending problem. Well, that, that most certainly is the case. The fact is, revenue-wise, uh, the carbon tax itself brought in three times what they expected. The, the uh, capital gains tax brought in three times what they expected. We are awash in billions of dollars, and yet the supplemental budget is spending every dime. We are the only state in the union sir, that has not had a tax decrease. There are a number of states, including Idaho and even some Democrat states that have had multiple tax re repeals or redu reductions, whether it's income tax, sales tax, whatever. Every single state, except for Washington state, and even with those billions in surplus, they intend to spend every dime of it. This is just unbelievable. This goes beyond California. It's, it's truly fascinating to watch and to be part of, you know, a budget writing team. Uh, again, I, I continue to serve on the capital budget. And, you know, and one of the things that we have to be, and I'm telling my colleagues, we have to be really cognizant of how we spend revenues that we haven't realized. Uh, you know, and, and with this initiative looming on the horizon for Climate Commitment Act dollars, I'm telling my, my fellow budget writers not to spend it. Don't put it anywhere in this budget, because if that money is repealed, if that money is repealed by the voters, and I have a, a very strong suspicion that it will be because, as I told the governor last week when I met with him, you know, and he was criticizing Republicans for not being committed to climate change, I said, Governor, I live in the greenest district in the whole of the nation. We literally emit zero carbon in the production of our energy. We have one of the only entire electric fleet of buses for our transit system in the whole of the country. Our, our district is committed to dealing with climate change. But when a single mother has to pull up to the pump and decide whether a dollar more uh, uh, above the national average is worth you know, her and her climate commitment, she is going to pick every time the fact that she cannot afford that pump 
She cannot afford that gas. So, you know, it's not about, it, it, you know, he's just out of touch. And I think when we talk about spending Climate Commitment Act dollars and the fact that they could be repealed, we'll be left with a giant budget hole, billions of dollars, if the, t if the citizens say we don't want this tax. And then the legislature will have to figure out how to fill that hole. And I just don't think we should put ourselves in that position, especially when we're awash with cash already. Well, you can see the exact thing happening in California. Governor Newsom down there facing a $68 billion. His deficit is almost as big as your entire budget. And that is due to overtaxation and the fact that people are fleeing the state. Large uh, taxpayers are leaving. They've done the analysis and they're leaving in scores. That's going to happen here. Ken Fisher's already left. Bezos already left. There's a lot of people who are going to pull stakes on this if that capital gains tax continues. Well, look, the budget's out of control. Uh, that's bad enough, but policy-wise, we don't see anything on crime either here. As a matter of fact, some of the bills we're seeing actually uh, make it tougher for police to operate. Um, they, they don't seem to have any idea of how bad it is out on the streets out here. The fact that they turned down the police pursuit initiative, which, by the way, was their bill. It was a Democrat bill. It was turned into an initiative that had the votes last year, but one chairman hung it up. The fact they're going to pass on that just amazes me. But in the realm of crime, do you see any movement whatsoever to reel in these criminals? Because it is getting worse by the day. We don't, you know, in fact, we're going the opposite direction, unfortunately. We're decriminalizing more things. Uh, we're making sentences lighter. We're releasing prisoners sooner and earlier and more often. Uh, and so that's the direction our state is choosing to go. And, and I will tell you, Carrie, as I said on your show before, when you talk about public safety, this is not a partisan issue. This is not a Republican versus Democrat issue. When I talk to people in my community of, of various parties and political leanings, everybody without fail says they want to feel safe in their homes, they want to feel safe in their communities, and when they call the police, they want them to show up. That is universal. That is not partisan. And so the fact that we're sitting here and not doing anything to address that, and in fact, we're making it easier for criminals to do business in Washington State, it's sort of fascinating to me. Well, yeah, and then the other big issue they keep talking about is homelessness and the drug issues. We're uh, among the highest in the nation in fentanyl overdose, fentanyl problems. Of course, homelessness per capita, we're in the top three. But yet, with billions of dollars spent, it just keeps getting worse. Uh, do you see any change in direction at all in that realm? I don't. We're going to continue to spend billions more uh, on homelessness. Uh, and again, it keeps it can, just continues to grow. And we've got some of the the largest percentage of homelessness homelessness camps in the whole of the country. You know, we see them on almost virtually now every you know right of way, and uh, it's just amazing. And we again, in in my time here in the legislature, we've spent billions billions with a B on homelessness, trying to address it, and we have not seen that needle move in our favor at all in terms of getting more people off the streets, getting them help they need. And in fact, when you decriminalize drug use and you make it easier for folks to get access to drugs, you, you actually exacerbate the homelessness problem. And we're not creating a pop opportunity for these folks to get the wraparound services that they must have in order to be successfully reintegrated into society. And that, if that's not our focus, then we're gonna keep seeing, we're gonna keep seeing homelessness grow. Yeah, well, we've, it, <laughs> we've proven it for four or five years in a row here now. All right, well, we're getting down to the end of the wire here. Of course, we'll have you back uh, in a week or two to get caught up again. But what, uh, what have I missed? Uh, wh what about your, yourself? Any special priorities for you in this round? And what are you uh, trying to do? Uh, I know the capital budget's a big thing for you, always has been. But uh, what else, personally, uh, are you taking on down there? Well, as you know, Carrie, it's a bit unusual for leaders to the, in the in the C-suite to sponsor legislation. So my goal is to help as many Republicans uh, policies move across the line as possible, negotiate in good faith with the other side to try and find policy that's good for all of Washington. And look, you know, as I say over and over again, typically our conversations here in this legislature are not Republican versus Democrat, they're urban versus rural, and trying to help folks understand that we have a different a different set of needs and a different set of delivery opportunities and resources in a rural setting than we do in an urban setting. And now, you know, representing a couple of urban counties along with Chelan and Douglas County, um, it's very, very interesting to see, you know, what those folks who are living in the more rural parts of those urban Snohomish and King counties are telling us. You know, they don't feel like they're part of their counties. Um, they don't feel like they're being heard and they don't feel like they're getting the resources they need either. Even in places like King County and Snohomish County, the rural folks are being ignored uh, and being left out. So my, my focus is to make sure that when we create public policy in Washington State, we do it with a bend on making sure everybody in rural communities are served as well as folks who are in urban communities. And it can't be about just moving everybody into a big city and turning 
all of Eastern Washington into a state park. We really have to be we have to be cognizant of the folks we serve all over Washington. Well, I couldn't agree more, and I can tell you those folks don't feel very served right now, but it's not your fault. You're doing all you can. I know you and Keith have your hands full over there. It's uh, the worst I've ever seen it. I've been watching this for 20 plus years, and I've never seen a situation where the Democrats were so far off one side of the dial and not willing to negotiate. Uh, so we'll keep following this. Hopefully there'll be some bipartisan agreement somewhere along the line. But we appreciate you being here today. Congratulations on your new office and your new position. And uh, we wish you the best. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks, Carrie. All right, that's it. We'll be back to wrap it up in just a few minutes. Welcome back. Well, there you have it, direct from Olympia. Uh, Mike Steele uh, talking about uh, the session and, uh, well, maybe not how, uh, or how it's going, but how badly it could go. It looks like the initiatives will all go to the ballot. That's not so bad. That's a good thing. But uh, some of those should have been considered or at least have hearings. That's what the Constitution says. But <laughs> I'll tell you, in the last few years, the Constitution hasn't meant a thing in Olympia, nothing at all. You can tell by the new gun bills that were introduced we didn't even talk about. They're completely unconstitutional, but they're going to run them anyway. And they'll be in court for years to come. There is nothing going in the right direction in Olympia. If you can tell me otherwise, <laughs> let me know at Kerry at ncwlife.com because I can't see it. Uh, when the Democrat chairman of the state of Washington says, we have no intention of working with Republicans and by 2026 we'll have a supermajority so we don't have to worry about it, that is no longer democracy, that is no longer a republic, that is simply a dictatorship from the left side, even though they accuse the right side of the same thing. That's exactly what it's becoming in the state of Washington. Let's hope that turns around. We've got a big election year this year. We'll be following it here on the 12th District and we'll be following those initiatives all the way to November. All right, I'm Kerry Condotta for NCW Life. Don't forget news at 5, 6, and 10 o'clock. That's local news right here on the NCW Life channel. Thanks for being with us. See you next week.